Welcome to the Nonprofit Report, your update on nonprofit organizations, issues, and leaders. I'm your host, Mark Oppenheimer. Today, we'll be discussing adult education and the life-changing impact it can have with special guests, Earl Buford, President and Council for Adult and Experiential Learning, which is based in Indianapolis, Carrie Harris, CEO of Literacy Pittsburgh, and Anthony Tassi, CEO of Literacy Partners in New York City. We just want to observe that that learning new things and sharing experiences is so important to human health and happiness at all ages. And you have a keen understanding of how adult education can benefit individuals and society at large. It can be a game changer. So, Earl, let's talk about the view uh, from your seat in Indianapolis and the work of the Council for Adult and Experiential Learning. How do you see this ongoing need for education, particularly in this new economy, given some of the challenges that we have in America. Yeah. First of all, thank you, Mark, and, and everyone for having me on this. this uh, I'm in Seattle, so but it's early morning, so I'll say this morning. Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, and the, the part of that is we're, we're a national nonprofit, so um, we have, I'll uh, give the details of who we are and what we do, um, but we are a membership organization steeped in credit for prior learning, steeped, steeped in systems connection work on behalf of adult learners. So that's what we've done since 1974. Um, while we were based in Indianapolis, prior to coming to Kale a year ago, I, I, I was in charge of the workforce board, workforce system in Pittsburgh, and Carrie is one of my former board members. So Carrie and I have, to, have the privilege of doing lots of great projects together, and we'll continue to work together, as Kale is also just, while we're based in Indianapolis, part of Strata Education Network, where we've just opened the Pittsburgh office as well. So our, our work is really you know, a strong amount of work. We focused on the adult learners and the higher education systems and great employers, great uh, workforce and education partners like Kerry uh, in that region as well. Um, back to the question uh, as I ramble on. Uh, yeah, it's what we've done for a long time, but it's really more important now than ever for a couple of reasons. One, um, with the you know, great resignation and, and, and the, you know, the, the myriad of, of disinformation about career pathways and how individuals can come going to get back into the world of work or grow in the world of work. Um, it's really important now to make sure they understand all the unique pathways through education, through workforce systems and all that. So that's one, it's really a map, a roadmap that's easy for folks to understand. I know Carrie will get into that and Anthony probably will as well. So our job at Kale has been more than us to make sure that the, the, these great systems understand or need assistance in developing these, these quality roadmaps for adult learners to know how to on, um, you know, the, the off and on ramps well to really know what the on ramp looks like moving forward. And I know I'm talking in, 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 in less detail, but I think there well, no, get the idea. This is, this is a really important point. So the on ramp, if, if you take a look at the on ramp in traditional education, it's going into a classroom, it's sitting in a desk. It's looking at at a blackboard or a whiteboard or, or whatever, and it's sitting there listening to somebody talking in English in paragraphs, right? Not so much interaction. Then you get an assignment, right? That that that's traditional on ramp, but that on ramp excludes a lot of people. So experiential learning. What you're saying is, is that particularly when you're dealing with adults, right? You have to basically meet them where they where they where live. Is that your experience as well, Carrie? And and Anthony, I'd, I'd love to have you join in because, you know, it seems that that what we're talking about is different regions of the country, but we're not really talking about different regions of, of the country. We're talking about everybody in the world, right? Aren't these points true for, for anyone everywhere? Yeah, absolutely they are. Um, uh, these are... Uh, sort of the way adults learn, regardless of what part of the globe you're on, uh, is by experience. I would say in our work, uh, we call our students uh, those left behind and those that have just arrived, but they never, ever, ever give up, right? So uh, our folks would uh, have not had success often in a K-12 system um, um, and or they might be newcomers to the United States as adults. They might've been newcomers as children and didn't do well uh, in the K-12 or just lack some basic skills. Uh, and so we see ourselves really sitting in that um, critical space like the safety net between K-12, higher ed and work. 
Uh, and for all folks who are struggling to make that transition or for whom that transition would not be easy, that's that's our people. <laughs> um, uh, and so uh, we're offering English language, reading, writing, speaking. Uh, we do basic skill brush up. Um, if you have a high school diploma, we'll, um, we will offer you, uh, you know, brush up math, reading what uh, related to your sort of industry, uh, career interest, will help you get your GED, will help you prepare for citizenship uh, if you're foreign born. Um, uh, but uh, ultimately our goal is to sort of reduce the friction between where you are now and where you wanna be um, uh, in terms of a contributing member of, um, of this uh, economy. Uh, our students, many of are mostly working already. Uh, they're often in low skill work. Uh, but they're looking to grab onto middle scale work. Um, and so they recognize that they need some um, additional uh, skills uh, to do that. So that's what we're here. Uh, we're here to do. Anthony, I just love Carrie's characterization of persistence, this this idea of never giving up. I, I met somebody who um, uh, came into literacy volunteers in New York City. Um, she ran a jewelry manufacturing business she held all the receipts, all of the numbers in her head. She couldn't read. She couldn't read. She kept everything straight through her own intellectual capacity. And she was determined to learn to read. She ended up uh, giving a speech at the United Nations um, at, at one of their lit uh, literacy conferences. Uh, she had come, but she never gave up. Um, Anthony, talk about the profile of students, because it's really important for us all to understand what the profile of your students are and, and, the, and the profile of those you serve. Yeah, thanks, Mark. Uh, the way it comes to me is, you know, corporate America and our society at large is really focused on artificial intelligence. Like you can't pick up a newspaper or turn on the news without hearing something about mm -hmm. artificial intelligence. But this, there's actually something more powerful than artificial intelligence in our society, and that's inherent intelligence. And I think what um, both Carrie and Earl have spoken to in the anecdote that you spoke about uh, uh, with the jewelry maker is really that we have millions of adults in America that are simply off the grid, right? And it's millions, and, right? It is millions. What are, what are the numbers? Earl, do you know? Do you have the who? Who has the numbers? <laughs> It, 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 it's changing so often. Some one recently I heard there are 10 million Americans who have college credit, but haven't completed. So it's, there's one group. Then there's um, the, the gap between those employed and those unemployed. I mean, there's, there's so many numbers, but they're all in, they're all high yeah. digits. Just put it that way. <laughs> a very, it's just a very high proportion of adults, right? Anthony? Yeah. 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 Uh, well, for New York city, which is where I, I really know the data best to begin with, we're talking about, 400,000 adults uh, without a high school degree, you know, born and bred in the United States with no high school degree. Then we're also talking about another 1.6 million immigrants who have limited English proficiency. Half of them don't have a high school degree, half of them do, right? So in New York City, that is up uh, over 25% of adults don't have sort of what we consider the basic skills for, um, you know, a, a family sustaining job. And so those individuals is just a systemic mismatch in our economy right yeah. now, where we have huge stores of human capital that are not being deployed effectively or efficiently. And, and that cascades course, down through the generations because if a parent is disadvantaged in that way or a grandparent, that, then ca that has effect on the child, right, Anthony? Absolutely. It's the biggest predictor of school success is the literacy levels of the parent. And, and that's how, you know, every nonprofit faces a, a, a challenge in focus and being student, you know, uh, community centered, really meeting people where they're at, but also being very focused to your core competency. And that's how we answer that question is focusing on parents because you help to solve today's problem today with what Earl and Carrie are talking about, getting people, helping them to make their way in the economy better post pandemic, but then also looking at the next generation because of that high predictive value of literacy culture in the home is what's going to drive the early academic performance. The early academic performance is what's going to drive the high school graduation rate and so on and so forth, right? Now, is this a systematic, a systemic response or systematic response to a systemic problem, Earl? Are we basically saying that, look, we've got a problem, we have a multi-generational problem, we need to attack it multi-generationally, 
and meet people where they live. Is is that sort of the the founding idea of of ensuring that we have gr- grand participation of all people and not have this <coughs> this capability be an impediment yeah. to Americans and others participating in our in in the daily life yeah. of the country. Yeah, we we at Kale say adult learners are the lifeblood of our of our economy. And if we uplift adult learners, we feel that you're uplifting entire communities. And so that's that's why I think that's the core. While we, you know, Anthony brought up a really good point about there's so many different pods of numbers of disconnected individuals from non diploma to <clears throat> non degrees to all those things. You know, just uh, labor market participation rate, all those things. But if we look at the, um, the adult learner as, as, a, as a community effort and then think about how to connect these systems better. Will we solve the scale on this? I'm not sure, but it's better than what we're doing right now. That's kind of <laughs> my unscientific approach to it. So that's why a lot of our work is really about male literacy partners, employers, systems, and higher education, how we help them, how we honestly broker them to work together in some, in some meaningful way. And it's been a lot of our lifeblood, lifeblood of our work. And this, it seems like this particular issue is one that can finally finesse and, and hopefully, you know, another, another issue is <clears throat> sort of the attacks on school children, right? But finally finesse these divisions because to me, it doesn't matter whether you're in a blue state or a red state or you're, you're, you're conservative or liberal or whatever, or progressive, whatever you want to call them, whatever, whatever political color we have. If you see somebody who can't read and you need employees, Right. You need people who are engaged. Right, Kerry? I mean, it doesn't matter. We we can all agree that that has to be solved and there are real solutions. So let's talk about what those specific let, let's deconstruct some of your programs and how you you get, first of all, um, identify people with needs and then you know, how you respond to them so that you're responding to different cohorts. Right. Uh, with their different needs. Right. I think in some ways it doesn't matter. Right. We could there's lots of reasons people might uh, need to be in that safety net of adult education. Um, uh, But there's lots of people that do quite well in K-12 and they come out and they still need brush up before they get a they need a math brush up before they go take the apprenticeship exam to be a steam fitter. Right. Uh, We we need to have an answer for that. Um, And that's what adult education does Uh, without making you go take a college class. (laughs) You can get some brush up uh, so that you can do well. uh, on that uh, on that apprenticeship exam, and, and boom, then you're suddenly grabbing on to a very up middle skills work uh, and um, a very sustainable life path. So uh, I think it could come that way. The other place it comes is from employers themselves, as you uh, indicated. Um, employers might recognize I've got this great person with very little credentials. I want to invest in them because they hustle, right? They can keep track of all those numbers in their head, like, <laughs> like the person that you described. Um, and so they might engage in adult ed on behalf of their own workforce, their incumbent workforce, um, And so we've done work like that, where we'll go in and teach language, English language tailored to uh, the vocabulary needed on the job. Um, And employers track those folks that take those classes. And guess what? They stay and they get promoted within the company. So it can come from the the job seeker themselves. It can come from the employer recognizing an opportunity uh, and it can come from the parent. Uh, uh, more than half of our students are parents, uh, you know, like Anthony's. Uh, and it is often the number one motivation. Like they recognize now that they have a child. <laughs> they want uh, they want to make sure that they can ensure their kid does better in school than they did. And they want to be able to interact effectively with the school. And they're recognizing, oh, this child rearing is expensive. <laughs> Let me figure out how I'm going to uh, uh, advance myself career wise. So change can come from anywhere. Uh, that sort of trigger that sends somebody into adult ed can come from lots of places. And, it, and it's a system that needs to be here to make the rest of it work, right? To make the workforce system work, to make higher ed work, um, to make work work uh, for more and more people. So can we contrast, are, are there any, any elements, uh, Anthony and Carrie, that you think are completely unique to Pittsburgh versus New York, right? Two different places, uh, two, you know, demographically different cities, historically uh, quite different in terms of where they are. 
New York being such a financial uh, center, uh, Pittsburgh being a, a past manufacturing center for the worldwide steel industry, then falling on difficult times and so on. Do you think that, that your programs are very similar, um, quite distinct? Do you feel like there are aspects that are completely unique? Or is this the kind of situation where different literacy programs, different places can actually share a lot of their intelligence together. Anthony? Yeah, I, I would say much more the latter, Mark. I mean, there's no one size fits all in this field or any other, probably. Um, but this is definitely, uh, you know, there are best practices that I think organizations have learned over the years. There are guiding principles that we have figured out and we've learned from other organizations. And the context, the Pittsburgh context is very different from the New York context. <laughs> but a lot of what Carrie is saying is really resonating with me. I got to tell you, she sounds like, you know, she just runs a fantastic program. Uh, and what makes her program fantastic is both her attunement to local culture, her connection to local community and, lo and, and reading of local opportunities that married together with, um, you know, really solid practice, you know, that's rooted in evidence and that has years of uh, professional experience to back it with. And so I think that those two elements together, you can probably run successful programs in just about any, any city or town in America. Earl, um, how do you see it? Do you do you feel like like you have to idiosyncratically um, uh, shape different programs or or collect different data, or is do we have such commonality in this issue across America that we can actually rationally share and benefit from from the experiences of all these different uh, smaller organizations that are trying to serve the same purpose? Yeah, great, fantastic question, and. And to answer your point about Carrie's program, it is fantastic. I'm on our board member, so I'm happy to hear you say that. So we okay. do really work to work together. But but that relates back to the question, Mark. It's a it's a combination of all the things. So we we look at um, programs. We also look at the we do research uh, and look at in, the innovations of certain certain programs and certain around certain sectors. And one of the reasons I say that story is when in our honest brokering work that we do with these systems or pillars I mentioned earlier. We, it's really important that we know who on the ground is doing what so that we get to connect again. So when I work in Pittsburgh, <clears throat> Carrie's right in the centerpiece of that because as we're working with higher ed and community colleges on one end and employers on the other end, she's already doing some of that work. So it's like, well, what can we do to support what's already happening as opposed to come to town and you know, on, a high, on, a, on our horse saying, we're going to gonna change our whole system. Well, no, that's not, there's already great things happening. They just may not talk to each other. Plus, let alone, let alone, let alone share data data that that you know, shows impact. Right, and regionally employment is different. Right, we have different regional uh, industries. So if you're in a rural uh, area, you might have different needs, and the examples that are being used as part of the employment lessons are going to be way way different than in an industrial city or in a in a yeah. uh, urban. Area. Our, our work in Pittsburgh is different than our work in in in, in parts of Texas, as as different than our work in uh, Spokane, Washington. Different than you know, you get the point. We can learn from each other, though. I would just offer exactly. um, two thoughts. One is early in my tenure here, uh, Earl organized a site visit to Milwaukee. Uh, and we learned about a program they were running with the uh, workforce program and their adult ed provider uh, where people were getting a, a pre-apprenticeship certificate and a GED at the same time. Mm -hmm. uh, brought that back to Pittsburgh. <laughs> and now we run, uh, we developed our own version of that. So um, again, sort of connecting the dots and what was right for our context, but wouldn't have even thought of it had I not had the opportunity to learn from the Milwaukee group. Similarly, I'm thinking about Anthony and, and their focus on the family. We have a small fledgling yeah. family literacy program. I can only imagine how much we could learn about the what I can see as a very sophisticated approach uh, to a two-gen and um, a two-gen model. We're sort of hoping that it catches for the most part <laughs> for the parents uh, that the K-12 connection uh, happens. Um, I, I know we have a lot to learn from what Anthony's doing in New York. You know, it, there's another aspect here that I think is, is really interesting because in so many areas, uh, we talk about the effect that the intersectionality that exists between um, race and poverty, right, has and how we should respond with culturally appropriate type of type of approaches. 
it seems here that we have that interplay with some very, very uh, transportable um, approaches across these different uh, bounds. In other words, if you're if you're uh, educating uh, people who speak uh, languages coming out of Asia or languages coming out of uh, Central and South America, right? And and you have different cultures. There's a lot here that's applicable, regardless as to what the background is. If you're if you're talking to somebody where English is a second language, there are a lot of the lessons learned that can be applied across different different ways. Are you are you all finding this as well? In that you have to also balance the difference with with the similarities and and shape programs informed by both sides of this, Anthony. Yeah, the way it comes to us, Mark, is really we we take a trauma informed approach, and what that means is um, an active listening, a listening first approach, a community building approach, a confidence building approach, a competence building approach, and so on. Um, and the reason we do that is because um, people who adults who are not reading and writing above a sixth grade, seventh grade level, uh, immigrants that are not able to speak the dominant language, they have experienced massive trauma in their lives, right? And like the migration, you know, there's a, a narrative in the United States about this is the best place to be, and it's uh, welcoming to everyone. That may be true, but it's a traumatic event for people who have been forced off their land due to climate well, change, last, forced off their last land. Of, last, lack of accessibility or the circumstances by which you actually get to this country and so on, very often in those cases, it traumatizes people. They go through added stress that people have not had to go through those experiences. So it's, trauma is not an event. It's just it's just the accumulation of the that that's what you're saying. It's the accumulation of these experiences. You couldn't access, you couldn't read, you can't understand those little micro things that happen. Uh, to, yeah, that, yeah, I mean, there, there there are traumas with a capital T and traumas with a small T. Mm -hmm. um, and one of the system systemic drivers of, you know, trauma is not evenly distributed across the population. Right. And that maldistribution is what we call oppression. Right. And then one of the biggest drivers of oppression is racism. So we think our work in adult education and family literacy, we think our work is primarily addressing racism. Right. That's the core body of our work. And we don't address it by by teaching people non-racist lang non language. We don't address it by, you know, going, ticking off a number of items. How we address it is by understanding racism as, traumatic, as a traumatic experience, intergenerationally traumatic. And that lens of viewing the opportunity for healing, that viewing the opportunity for growth and understanding that inherent intelligence has been suppressed, inherent capacity has been uh, pushed to the margins. And the process of bringing that all front and center in a supportive process, that's a process, that's a methodology that works across many, many different cultures, right? So we don't try to find, you know, what's similar about Vietnamese to African-American. We don't try to, that's not our approach. Our approach is really to understand uh, that we're here to support each other and that in, in unlocking the inherent potential for education and learning, you're actually tapping resiliency, as we've mentioned here, right? You're tapping persistence, you're tapping um, a process of healing, which is what we in the education space really call trauma-informed approach. So that's that's how we 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 view bridging these these apparent gaps and these apparent differences is really to focus on uh, this core process. That's just so fascinating. Earl, you, you look like you wanted to say something. Uh, I was just sort of. No, I, I was. Yeah, that. I was just really and in, 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 um, really just in, enjoying uh, Anthony's approach and, and, and Lucy Parton's approach. So he really saw joy in my face. On, and and because that's still not the, the norm, even though we talk about common form approaches, you don't hear it as, as profoundly as, as Anthony just laid out. So that's my expression you saw. And Carrie, you you also seem to be uh, an actor supporter. You know, it's it's interesting for people who um, who don't understand the language that insiders use. I loved Anthony your your description of the capital T and the small T, right? Those those little things, and and it just strikes me that America is the only place where we look at multilingualism as something to be frowned upon. I don't get it. Um, <laughs> I speak. I speak a couple languages. I wish. I wish I could speak Spanish. I didn't. I don't speak Spanish. It's, it's such a huge language in the United States. And if I could speak five languages, 
Darn it, I, I, I would speak five languages, Carrie. Um, how, do you, how do you honor the, the multilingual side of, of the people who come to you so that while you might be teaching English as a second language, that it is not done in a way that is in some way disrespectful to the language and communication modes that people already have, that you're uplifting, you're honoring culture without trying to hide it. I mean, if you take a look at the history of how uh, Native Americans were, were taught English and with, with this idea of destroying their traditions and creating disrespect amongst generations and so on, you could actually see that happening out of good intent how do you, Carrie, ensure that that is not the approach that is taken forward in literacy uh, Pittsburgh? Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, I, I couldn't have articulated it as beautifully as Anthony did, but we definitely yeah. we are centered on the strengths of the students, that what they're uh, what they're bringing. Um, and so we can sit, we call our program English language learning because we're not assuming it's your second language. Uh, it might be your third or your fourth. Uh, and um, it is something to celebrate everything that you bring to uh, to the. Um, to the learning process. And so our classes, our English language learning classes might have people from 20 different countries um, uh, in them, and they will very much be a celebration of who you are, right? That is part of, it's one of our core values. Everybody uh, is bringing something amazing to the classroom. Uh, and it becomes, I mean, if you you've ever get the chance to sit in, in an ELL class, do it. It will feed your soul, right? Uh, to see... Um, uh, what people are bringing, how much they're loving being together and trying to crack the code of what it means <laughs> to be an American together. Uh, they're celebrating each other's cultures. They're, you know, bringing food to class. And, um, you know, the instructor will often organize a lesson uh, around different cultural traditions. Uh, but it, it, it's just an opportunity to teach English, right? We'll, we'll try to build um, the lessons in those kinds of ways. Uh, and that's just a small example of how we're um, celebrating what everybody brings to the table um, and not trying to uh, whitewash it literally with some crazy idea of what it means <laughs> to be an American. And whether whether you just need to, whether your first and only language is English and you just need to brush up on your math skills or you need to um, to uh, improve your reading skills, all of these different services are there for you in order to allow you to engage. You'll find a, a friendly and understanding uh, group of people who themselves have had their own challenges. And if you can volunteer at one of the various literacy programs that are certainly in your town, no matter where you live in the United States, there is a literacy program there for you. Earl Buford, president of the Council for Adult and Experiential Learning, based in the Indianapolis National Organization, Carrie Harris, CEO of Literacy Pittsburgh, a great, great city, and another great city, New York City, Anthony Tassi, CEO of Literacy Partners. Thank you so much for helping us to understand this, this, uh, this really complicated uh, topic. You've just made so much clear. Thank you, uh, participants, for attending. Thank you, attendees, for uh, helping me with your prompts. Everybody stay safe and take care. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks for having us, Mark.